All right, welcome to yet another very special episode of the Mike Sanello Show. Tonight we'll be interviewing Board of Education candidate Eric Hansel. Um, before we get started, we'll just just a few bits of housekeeping to keep up with. Folks at home, um, we have some upcoming interviews. Eric will not be the last one. He's just the second in our debate series. Uh, uh, we have a councilman that we're looking to schedule for Sunday night, so stay tuned for that. Um, Eric, I believe your video has uh, crashed. If you want to start your video again real quick. Um, okay, so yeah, so we have a councilman for next Sunday that sh we're looking to hoping to schedule that for uh, two th for seven p.m. Once we get everything nailed down, I'll tell you who that is and exactly when that is. We're looking to schedule a board of uh, bo I'm in conversation with a board of finance candidate um, to schedule them for later on in the week. Uh, and I've been reaching out to the other board of education candidates as well, including uh, Democrat candidates as well. So for anyone who's out there who wants to come on and have a conversation. Um, I'm happy to have you guys join. I'm happy to extend the formal invitation out to anyone who wants to come on who is a candidate for uh, elected office here in New Milford. Uh, real quick, on, as far as my end is concerned, you guys will see links to follow me on MeWe. Don't follow me there anymore. I'm looking to get that channel uh, uh, deleted um, because I've had a security issue there. Um, Instead, I'm going to actually be I'm building my Discord server. I'm just about done with that, just about done with my tests with all that. So you guys, uh, I'll get a link out to that fairly soon. For those who have been watching and have been following the clips along with my, uh, of the, the clips that I've put together as a series and playlist here on Facebook of my interview with Mayor Bass, I'm hoping to do the same thing here. Um, uh, so when we get done with this interview, um, we'll be, we'll be, Stay tuned for those clips if you want to see this in a more, slightly more digestible format. Last last thing before we get started, yes, we will get to your live audience Q&A. So if you have questions for uh, Board of Education candidate Eric Hansel, get them in and just fire them off right now before you forget what they are, and we will get to them at the end of our interview, probably around the 45 or so minute mark. We went way over last week with Pete Bass. Hopefully we won't be going way over with Eric Hansel. Um, it looks like we're having some technical difficulties with Eric here. Um, I want to just make sure that everything's going smoothly here. So if you can bear with us. Um, yeah, okay. So Eric has signed off. It looks like we, he, we had a little bit of a crash. So if you can bear with me, folks, while we, while we, uh, while we get that, that service, um, hopefully that will be returned to us momentarily. Uh, I just want to check, make sure everything's going smoothly. For those uh, who are tuning in, thank you so much. Uh, again, if you are watching at home on Facebook, uh, I just want to see how things are going. If you guys are watching at home on Facebook, you guys uh, can also tune in on YouTube as well because we are dual streaming to YouTube. Uh, there's Eric. He's coming back. Uh, if you guys are watching at on uh, YouTube, you guys are welcome to join in on, on the conversation in Facebook as well. I will be f uh, forwarding and directing Eric's the questions for Eric uh, to, uh, from you, both YouTube and on Facebook. So you guys, like I said, if you want to get that in, go ahead and get that those questions in. I'm going to turn up my volume just a hair. Yeah, so that's about where I probably want to be. Uh, Eric has rejoined us, which is excellent. Eric, it looks like we're getting some pretty straightforward video. Uh, let me just do a quick bit of resizing while while I get everything taken care of. Um, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna resize, folks. You can deal with it. So uh, right before we get to pull in, Eric, uh, we are using this as a moment to test dual streaming. So guys, let me know in the comment section what you guys think of this. I'm hopefully going to be bringing this to the town council meetings. Uh, there is a town council meeting t on Tuesday night. Uh, there's also a, an American Rescue Plan Act um, funds public meeting. That's a lot mouthful on Wednesday night before the Board of Finance meeting. So stay tuned to that. That's a really important way for uh, the members of the Board of Finance and for the members of uh, the elected offices, of course, to um, get your thoughts and information. So since we've gone through all of that, um, if you guys if you guys want to see the dual streaming, just let me know too, because that's something I'd like to try to bring to town council if we can. So stay tuned for that. But since we, we're, we've gotten them back on, and it seems like we've gotten taken care of our technical difficulties, um, everybody, welcome on Eric Hansel. Eric, thanks for coming on the stream. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So, Eric, before the first question, of course, before we get started, how can people reach and follow you? I have a Facebook page that's uh, it's Eric Hansel for BOE. Awesome. So everyone can follow you on Facebook. That's the place to go. All right. That's right. 
So um, we're going to start off the way we do with every other interview. Uh, I, I always like to ha allow the voting public to get to know the candidate or the person before we get to know the candidate, just a little bit at the very least. So as a sign of good faith, we're going to ask you the same question that we ask everybody who comes on for this sort of purpose. Eric, what brought you to New Milford? Uh, uh, more than one reason. Uh, I was uh, newly married and we had a young child and I uh, wanted to uh, find a neighborhood environment like the one I grew up in where I could just let my kids go outside of the house, ride their bikes, play, go to the corner store. Uh, as it turns out, my, uh, my wife grew up in New Milford. And uh, so we moved and it was a house for sale in that neighborhood and we bought that house. And uh, it's met my expectations. Actually, the, the whole experience has exceeded my expectations. We've been there for uh, 25 years now. The boys have uh, you know, went through New Milford Public Schools. Both of them graduated, went on to college. Uh, graduate college, moved out of the house. So it's now there's my wife and I back in this neighborhood looking forward to all the trick-or-treaters that we get. Awesome. So you've been here quite some time then. Yeah. Yeah. Just curious to know where, did, where did, uh, since your wife was born and raised here, where did you guys, uh, where'd you guys meet? Where'd you guys come from? What was the, where was the emigration from? Oh, that's interesting. Well, we met at work at the time we were both working at Perkin Elmer, uh, famous okay. for the space, the space telescope. Uh, and so I met her there and uh, we dated for a few years, uh, got married. Uh, we moved here from Reading. I had a, a small apartment that was close to work, but I was born and raised in Danbury. And uh, uh, so, you know, it's kind of a, a short story, but. Uh, it's, it well, it's, it's, it's just it's just nice to, to know, um, you know, where people are, are coming from, you know. So, so it sounds like you were from the area and you just preferred New Milford over you know, the specifics of where you were living before. Oh yeah. We, you know, I wanted a place where the kids could just go out and play in Reading. That would have been way out of our price range. Uh, I see. Been, yeah. That's understandable. Yeah. And plus her parents were right down the road here. Uh, we, you know, she grew up in the town, so we, uh, she knew a lot about it and it just sounded like a, the kind of experience that we wanted for our kids and our family. Awesome. So, so you've been in town for a long time. What yeah. the what it, it, what was it that first brought you into the world of politics? Huh. Well, I'm always uh, I've always been a bit of a news wonk. <laughs> I follow everything. Uh, I when my kids moved out of the house, I started thinking about getting involved in, in politics, and uh, the school board in particular, I thought would be a really good one because of the wonderful experience that both of my kids had in the Milford Public School System. Uh, and I felt like it was my turn to give back a little bit. So, you know, once the boys were out, I had a little time and thought this would be a good time to go in and, you know, do my part and try and make sure that everyone else's kids have that same wonderful opportunity and experience that my boys did. And it, uh, it takes, it's a lot of work. I've uh, seen a few of the people on the board and it, this, this doesn't happen by accident. There's a lot of people, and uh, I've, I've come to respect them all quite a bit. They put in a lot of their time to make sure that all this comes together. Yeah, so there's actually, like you said, there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to the Board of Education that probably don't get commonly seen in the public purview. Um, that if you're not familiar with it, I mean, it, it can, can be a little bit of an information overload. Oh, yeah. So... Yeah specifically about the Board of Education, was there a, an event that, that attracted you to the Board of Education that attracted you to, to get into this field? Or was it a, a fairly recent thing? Or was it a... I'd love to know the, the backstory of where that came to be, because you've only served on the Board of Education for a brief moment because of right. people who have left the board and you're filling in for their in their shoes. So I'd, I'd love to hear where that com where that comes from. Ah, well, a, a friend of mine is on the, uh, is on the town council. Okay. And, and he had, do you mind, do you mind well, saying the name? I'd love to hear. Sure. Mike Nahum. All right. And, uh, and famously, I, I'll say I was his second choice <laughs> for no good reason. I, it's just <laughs> funnier that way. Uh, but he had, he, there, there was an opening on the board and actually I've come to realize it was a couple of openings on the board. Yep. And, uh, and so when he told me about it, I said, Hey Mike, I've been wanting to get into politics. Hmm. Do you think I'd be good at this? He goes, oh, yeah. You know, he, he hadn't he hadn't realized I wanted to do something like this. And so uh, uh, I, I saw the opportunity. And so I jumped at it, both feet. So it's interesting you mentioned Mike Nahum because he serves on the town council. And uh, I've done a lot of coverage of the town council and not a whole lot of coverage on this channel of the Board of Education. 
Uh, and that's more of just from a policy standpoint because they're the legislative arm and the Board of mm -hmm. Education is hyper-focused on this one thing, which is the education. So it's, it's, it's tough for me to have broad sweeping conversations when it comes to the Board of Education and they're so hyper-focused on the two. And there's a huge bifurcation under the law even between the two bodies so that there's extremely little, let's say, oversight. There's, a, the, there's an extremely little hierarchy, if you will, between the two bodies. There's a lot of the Board of Education is free to do a lot of things on uh, the town, town side as well as, you know, there's a lot of bifurcation. Um, so I'd love to hear if you've, if you've been able to follow the town council, uh, what you've noticed mechanically of the differences between the two bodies. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I started going to the town council back in July when I found out about this position and I wanted to get more in touch with the people involved. And, and you do know an awful lot about it because, yeah, that's that's true. The town council and the board of education are two completely separate bodies, of course. And the town council has much broader range of uh, of things they deal with. They 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 set policy. They, they set uh, mandates, if you will, um, whereas the Board of Education implements policy uh, that comes down from the state for the most part. So, yeah. um, and, and the Board of Education is hyper-focused. So I've been through a couple of town council meetings. I, I think the first one I sat through, I thought it was super interesting. And, and uh, just seeing that they, they, they had one uh, topic that it had to do with this person's dead end road and the rights and everything that had somehow gotten forgot almost a hundred years ago. <laughs> and it was just an eye yeah. they needed to die. And they were also happy to dot that eye too. And it was, it was one of their longest open items that uh, it just turned up. Uh, then there's a lot of uh, conversation going back and forth uh, between the different members and they're all very civil and, uh, and, and just the topics I was, I, you know, I had no problem sitting through it was a couple hours too. And I did that twice and uh, enjoyed it both times. And my plan is to try and go to those town council meetings as much as possible. Cause it's, hmm. I think, you know what, I think it helps. It would help a lot of people to go to those meetings. Likewise with the school board to, to see that these are actual people that are, are, are trying to do their best. And they really are to help, you know, Democrat, Republican, they're doing their best. They want what's best for the town and they might have different paths that they want to do that, but they're, they're all quite sincere. And uh, I think it would, uh, it, it would make people maybe, if not a little less concerned for things, but maybe a if they understood it a little bit, they wouldn't worry so much. They could start to understand uh, how they could even contribute themselves to help fix things that need to be fixing. Right, right. So when you have a when you have a complaint, you know, if you go to these meetings, usually those complaints are just resolved because the reason that whatever thing you're 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 complaining about has come to fruition has there's a rationale for all of that, and you kind of see that at these meetings. So yeah. one of the main mechanical differences between the board of education and town council is the board of education has subcommittees that serve the board itself, and a lot of what's actually handled through the process in terms of process with the Board of Education, is actually handled during these subcommittee meetings. Now, I don't know if you've had a chance to serve uh, with your uh, subcommittees, uh, but you are on the facilities and operations. Do I have that correct? That's right. All right. Can, yeah. Have you had a chance to, to, to sit in on those meetings and serve with those committees? And if you have, I'd love was, to hear your thoughts. I was just recently sworn into the Board of Education uh, about uh, a month ago. Yeah, I missed the last uh, uh, operations and and, uh, and facilities meeting uh, because of you know just missing the date. So my mm -hmm. first one is coming up this week on I believe it's Thursday. Do you want to talk about what you what your expectations are here? I don't have a, a lot of experience about what they do, other than I mean recently uh, at one of the at the board meetings, I know. I know that they've been talking about different renovations and things that need to take place. Uh, uh, you know, honestly, I don't know all that much about that. Uh, what what to expect? I, uh, I'm, you know, I, I have an open mind. I'm a fast learner. Uh, if it's if it has to do with uh, properties and and the different uh, maintaining them, I know that the the roof on the high school, we're waiting for materials to come in. Mm -hmm which is why we're actually waiting for it. They're also that it started it this summer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah. So, so, there's, a, there's a lot there. Yeah, to, be, to, to, to be fair to, to the folks at home. And I said this before with Pete uh, in the months that I was the, uh, 
per, that I was that my company was contracted to record and broadcast these meetings. Um, you know, because I'm doing so much whack a mole with the with uh, you know, the equipment and the hardware and the software, I can only really pay like fifty percent attention to the actual content. But Eric, since you really have only been uh, since your tenure has only been about a month, we're not yeah. really going to focus. Unlike the the Pete Bass interview, there isn't four years of uh, content plus however many years that Pete Bass was um, was a councilman. We don't have a lot of tenure to go with, so we're going to focus more on what to expect, right? What what people can expect if you get elected in terms of your your general politic and and how you how you, you view the role of governance here, and unfortunately. And well, unfortunately, I, it's just the nature of these these boards, both with the town council and the board of education. A lot of the things that you guys run into aren't multi-decade issues. They're issues that are served ad hoc. Uh, for example, all of the issues that you guys have run into when it comes over the last year or two, when it comes to virtual classrooms, when it comes to hybrid classrooms, when it comes to, and we're going to get into this, um, adhering to the executive orders from Ned Lamont. These are things that you guys kind of handle ad hoc, like you handle them as they come, right? And it's not like we have an immigration thing that we have to deal with here with the Board of Education here where it's going to be like a multi-decade uh, issue that's going to span, you know, 30, 50 years or, or a, debt, a debt reconciliation issue that's going to span 30 or 50 years. There's not a whole lot to go into a, a, a tenure other than the budget. So we know every year we're going to have to deal with this contentious issue, which is the Board of Education budget, which is the town budget, which is what's going to happen in March, April, and all those processes, and then in May when people go to actually vote uh, at mm -hmm. referendum. So let's talk about the budget. The first thing I want to ask you about, I hope you've been following things around town, has the, has the Board of Education budget ever been cut? In the past few years, no. That's a misconception. It's been, it's been held constant or increased. So the dollar amount from year to year has gone up, and that does not constitute a budget cut. Yeah, no, that doesn't. I, I'm sure there are some ways to interpret it as such, but the well, no. I bring that up because it's been a talking point in town. It's been a complaint in town of certain folks, and I just wanted to clear all of that up. Um, yeah, so, I was wondering where that question came from. Uh, that's uh, yeah. that kind of ties in what I was saying before about it. You know, if you can just show up at the meetings, you can ask that question and. Oh, they, they, they actually really like when people show up at the meetings. You have three minutes, and that sounds like a pretty pretty quick well, question to ask. Three minutes if uh, if Wendy Fallenbach wants to give three minutes. Sometimes she's given as much as five. I've even yeah. seen situations where there's only been one person on a one-topic meeting, so she's let them just go. Um, so... Uh, yeah. So as far as as far as what can residents expect, let's talk about like general politics. Let's talk about the thirty thousand foot view first. So what sure. can what can people expect in terms of your view of of process when it comes to governmental systems like the Board of Education? I'm very objective in, in my point of view on things, and what I mean by that is uh, I don't do things just based on my feelings. I I, I want to adhere to what our policy is. Uh, the Board of Education has their bylaws are outlined. They're very specific about what our responsibilities are. They're, they're, it's, they're, they're actually posted for everyone to see. It's, it's on the town website, uh, BOE for the Board of Education. And so my, what you can expect from me is I'm gonna look to those policies and I'm gonna try and stay within our wheelhouse on this, um, both in terms of my actions at these meetings and what I might be able to say, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, because uh, the fact the fact that matter is I'm a one person on a nine person board, and we have uh, very restrictive and like you said, very focused bylaws, uh, and you can count on me to to try and stay in those lanes. Uh, if something, if I see someone else going outside of the lanes, I will not be shy about pointing out that hey, that's not. Part of that's not within our bylaws. That's not our responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that is where a lot of the uh, you see uh, certainly on television you see these contentious uh, board of education meetings and, and such. I think a lot of the problems uh, can start when the board starts going outside of of their their um, their their mission. Purvious, yeah. You know? And uh, and then what happens when you do that is you start losing your integrity. When integrity is a funny thing. It takes years to build up your integrity. So even on a school board, 
it would. That, that is a long-term thing that we have, whereas we have a lot of tactical things to worry about. From a strategic standpoint, it's important for us to maintain the integrity of that body. So as soon as you start doing things that, even though people don't know exactly what the bylaws are, it kind of rings as if these people are getting a little bit too out of out of their wheelhouse. Yeah, we're, we're going to get into that tonight, trust me. Yeah, and you lose your integrity. And once you start losing your integrity, then people question everything you're doing and ugh, the wheels fall off the bus. Sometimes people just got to trust you. And if they can't trust you, uh, it, it makes it very difficult. So how does that general view of process now translate to translate to what you can expect from Eric Hansel uh, when it comes to the to time to build the budget? Um, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and with, as far as the budget's concerned, I'm looking at this as a standpoint of trying to maximize the value. I've got three, I've got two customers. I've got the uh, students and the families of those students, and I've got the taxpayers in town. Who, like, I've just joined those ranks, so I don't have a, uh, any children in the schools, but I am still very concerned about how those schools are doing. That the the that, that little society, that little microcosm really is a bellwether for how the town is doing. And, uh, and then, so those are my two customers. And then our boss is the state of Connecticut. They're the ones who make the mandates and the different laws that we have to implement and meet, you know, 180 days of school, yada, yada. So, uh, so what you can count on for me is I'm looking at the students and the taxpayers as my customers. And I'm going to take that responsibility seriously. I want to maximize the value. So sometimes we, we're going to have to ask for more money. Inflation, we want to make sure that we have a good environment. We want to keep these teachers who, um, they're, they're pretty impressive. That is not an easy job. And, and I was uh, really impressed with how well they did with my kids in the school and how much patience they had for them. And, uh, and uh, um, so you can count on me to try and maximize the value. And sometimes uh, I'll try, I'll look for all sorts of alternative ways, um, but uh, we'll try and make everyone happy if I can. Do you, do you consider those two interests, the taxpayers and um, well, the two interests of the taxpayers and the students probably not a competing interest, but do you think there are ever any competing interests when it comes to say serving the teachers or providing the teachers to serve the students and also serving the taxpayers? Is there ever any co competition of interest there? Hmm. Yeah. Could you rephrase that for me, please? Okay. So whenever you have multiple pe groups that you need to serve, sometimes there can be competing interests between the groups. Mm -hmm. So when you're providing the teachers to serve the students, right, is there a competing interest then within the teachers with, with, I won't say necessarily, but there may be overlap, but are there places where there are competing interests between the service of the students with the teachers Yep. And the service of the taxpayers with ostensibly lower taxes. I, I'm going to say a straight up no, and then okay. I'd like to follow up and say that I think oftentimes it's it's a question of uh, people's perception because I think that it, it, whatever is success is good for the students and good for these teachers and good for the school system is going to be good for those taxpayers. And, and, and some people might not see that; they might just be looking at, "Hey, this is my tax; I'm paying on this." Uh, why do I want to pay more? I don't have a child in the school. That that's probably true. Oh, not probably. You would know for sure if you had a child in the school. Yeah, obviously. I would imagine. I would hope. But what you might not realize is that there's a super effect, there's a second order effect. If that school's falling apart, if no one wants to move to New Milford because there's a there's a stigma associated with the schools that they don't get good support. They're 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 in disrepair. Yeah, what you know you got to you can do this whole list. That's going to have a, a negative uh, super effect on items such as the property values, uh, the people that are moving in town. The, the, so it, it does it, it does matter to the taxpayer, that homeowner, if um, if if the schools are healthy or not. So to that effect, of course. There's no such thing as an unlimited resource. Resources are by their nature scarce. So yes. you talked about efficiency, which means I think reflects what I just said, that there's no such thing as, an, as a resource which is not scarce. Um, yes. So to that regard, you, you said there are certain, you seem to intimate that there were certain things that kind of best predict outcomes, I would suggest. Um, 
what are what are those things that you that are predict predictive of those those student outcomes? Uh, you talked about the physical facilities. What are those things that you would focus in on as far as where the expenses are best delivered? What I would focus in on is there's there's a lot of wants versus needs in, in any education. So we've got reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, that, which I would expand, include the different sciences, both physical and, and biological, that those would be the priority. Uh, there might be some other classes that we would want that we would have to look at and say, hey, what kind of value are we getting out of this? Or there might be another activity we're gonna wanna add that, hey, what's, what's our value on this? And I, I would always look at those from the standpoint of, are they going to further our mission as, as, as a town, as a, a member of the Board of Education to provide for the best uh, educational experience, the best outcomes, uh, the most opportunity uh, as possible. Now, I think that there are some things that people might want to do that aren't going to have that uh, that payback. Uh, so you know, the school might they might want to do, uh, they might want to take their spend their sp send their Spanish class to Spain or something like that, and looking for money for that. Um, we'd have to look at that, see where we're at, uh, how are we financially stable right now, uh, what do we have coming up in the future, and there are you know we do consider uh, repairs that might be. That, 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 that have to happen now or might be happening in a few years. And we try and make sure that we're prepared for those. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I don't, that doesn't mean just throwing a bunch of money at something. Uh, it, it, Cause that, that doesn't make folks more creative. I mean, we need, it's, it's a team effort here too. I, and I think that right now uh, there's, we seem to be getting a pretty darn good value. Uh, my understanding is we, we don't spend a lot of money for a student compared to the talents around here. And so I would say we have a really good track record and very, we're getting a very good value now. Um, so in ways, I don't want to say ever doing anything on that board is going to be easy because I see how hard everyone's working already. Uh, I'm picking up a lot of, uh, just going to a lot of meetings and, and this new uh, committee that I'm on, I'm sure it's going to take a lot. But uh, I, I do know that uh, I, what I want to do is just sort of keep us uh, on the straight and narrow and the track that we're on right now. Okay, so last question on the budget then, because you, you talked about a lot about broad spending issues and how mm -hmm. we don't spend as much per student, um, but we get a lot of bang, if you will, per buck. So uh, the question I want to pose to you then is, is there a correlation, do you know of any correlation between overall spending on those students and actual outcomes? Well, that, it doesn't seem to be. However, I mean, one of the things that I would be concerned with is uh, we want, you know, employee retention that uh, you'd have to look to see how, how that is uh, with all the other towns and everything. And I think that maybe everyone's having a bit of a trouble with that. Um, I know that the students are getting plenty of opportunity uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the schools in Connecticut in general have a good reputation. Uh, when we were looking at different colleges with my kids, uh, you know, they, as soon as they found out you were from Connecticut, the book they were like oh okay we don't got to worry about the school system that your, your kids went to uh, and and then let's move on to some other things so i think that uh, we we have we we have to make sure we don't steal defeat from the jaws of victory uh, there's a lot of things that go into making us anything work uh, in the case of our school system there are a lot of moving parts mm -hmm. there's a lot of very subtle things uh, the football games that people like to attend, different activities. Who knows what is going to be, what is the linchpin? What makes everything work? Is it the cafeteria? Is it the teachers? I would say it's all of these things. And uh, one of the things that I'd be very careful about is doing anything to disturb a, a balance that we might not completely understand. Okay. And, and, and so I actually, to go back to the question that you asked, uh, not that I don't want to change anything. A, I'm not being elected king of the school board. I'm just one of nine. Yep. Uh, B, well, I think one of the uh, one of my strengths as a uh, was well, an engineer, and I think the strength I'm going to bring to the school board is that it, 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 it may sound silly, but I know what I don't know, and, and I'm and, and I like to learn from other people. I'm not going to walk in there thinking I know everything. There are things I'm very strong in. I have strong opinions, but uh, through in a system as complex as this, uh, I'm going to do a lot of listening 
probably for this these first few months. If there's there's mm-hmm. something I feel strongly about, I'll speak up about it. But I, there's a lot to learn, and I think that things in the school had been going pretty darn good. I want to make sure we keep that going. We don't want to pull out anything that's important to that experience that the kids are having. So um, we're, I really want to move on to some things like the enrollment study because that's it only just just got released. Um, you were at that that special meeting and you got a chance to see the presentation of the construct contractors that saw that enrollment study. And I think that's going to inform a lot of policymaking moving forward um, because n- there was a lot of things that were in that enrollment study that people may not be aware of. But before we get into that, one of the drive, one of the reasons I'm, I'm bringing up this enrollment study is the, is the drivers of, well, the one topic we know is going to come up next year, and that's that's um, the budget. What is the or so we all know that in any budget there are variable and fixed costs. Do you want to talk about the origins of these variable costs versus the fixed costs? Yeah. The um, I'm, I'm sorry, my phone is exploding. <laughs> there yeah. must be a lot of people. I think I, I shouldn't have it on. Uh, so there is there's there very, we've got fixed costs of, of maintaining the facilities mm-hmm. and there's, it's more than just teachers there's i think something like around 400 employees that go into a school so we've got teachers we've got custodians we've got uh, people who keep the grounds so there's there's a lot of fixed costs involved with the school we've got variables in terms of where is our population in town going and, and you know what's is that population to have school aged children are they moving in or are they moving out? So we, the, the study that you referred to was uh, we had farmed out and uh, there's, and I forget the name of the organization, they're, they're local. And uh, they looked into all the schools in the area and, and gave us a, a, a looked like about 10, five, 10 year look ahead as to what we can expect with our population. And uh, it was interesting because they showed uh, the history and I was, my school, my kids were in school during that part of the history when the population of the school age, the school population peaked and we're on almost a slow downward slope right now. Yep. And, and I wouldn't say it's heading to zero for sure. It's, it might be leveling off. Uh, it might not be. Uh, frankly, I was surprised that the, when all of a sudden we had people from New York City moving into the town this past year, uh, probably with a lot of folks. Uh, so, uh, that was, that was useful. And, and what it was, was also elucidating in so much as I saw that a lot of analysis goes into us pick, making this budget. You know, we, we have, uh, you know, one of the schools needs, uh, needs HVAC work. A bunch of the schools are doing great. So we know we've got to do the HVAC work on this one uh, part of the school. So we've got money that's going to go there. And, uh, and that all things like that go into that budget. And a lot of work goes into that as far as negotiations with. uh, So, so the driver of those variable costs, is it teachers or is it students? Because at the end of the day, do the teachers, are the teachers there for their own right? Or are they there to serve a certain population of students? They, by your own right, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but they they are, they certainly do serve the, the students. Uh, and I think that they, they, uh, they really do a heck of a job. We're getting a lot of value out of that. A lot of the costs are not just the teachers. There's a, a lot of other people. There's a lot of other uh, people there. There's, there's administrators, there's, uh, uh, people in facilities. And, and from what I can see, they're all work, they're all kind of overworked even. So it's, uh, it's the, the, the concern here is we want to make sure that no one burns out. Yeah. So I'm going to share a link for everybody who's watching. Uh, this is the enrollment study. You guys can check that out. That's actually the link to um, the meeting minutes from that special meeting that Eric was talking about. At the end of the meeting minutes, as the addenda to that meeting, you uh, you can see the um, you can see the, uh, the the presentation that they, they made, which because it includes the PowerPoint slides, and it includes the actual uh, written study, the written analysis that they provided at that at that meeting as well. So guys, if you want to follow along, that's a great, it's a great link to follow in. It's a great thing to look into. It's going to take some time to go over it if you, if you want to do that at home. But the, the point is that the enrollment study was basically, in terms of just the, the population, it was indicating that trends were headed to continue to go down. So I'd love to get your thoughts quickly on what they revealed of the past, which is something I've talked about on this channel quite a bit. Um, what are your thoughts on the growth of the budget, despite declining enrollment 
and the relinquishment of JPS. This is why I brought up the differences between variable and fixed costs. And yeah. I'll just give you a, a one data point that's before we get into the, the, the uh, prospects. And the, the uh, enrollment study actually kind of confirms this. Since t- in 2019, budgets had increased by over 30% since 2005, despite a roughly 25% decrease in enrollment to that point. And of course, the, rel- the relinquishing of JPS to the, municipal, to the municipal body. So what are your thoughts on those budget increases despite the declining enrollment? That's kind of consistent what what I said. It's not just the teachers. There's uh, facilities costs uh, that uh, that probably account for most of it. We've got uh, we've got the uh, I think it's in North one of the schools I know needs needs uh, the HVAC work needs and you'll see it in that report needs to be uh, redone. Uh, that's not cheap. Things like that really drive uh, the budget. Uh, the the schools. Uh, geez, time goes by so fast in Milford high school. I remember it when it was brand new, it's not brand new anymore. And yeah. so there's, there's an, it's in great shape still, but all of these facilities require uh, money to maintain them. There's a lot of real estate that goes along with the school. So as you see, and, and as you see the, these costs increasing uh, now you, you, it's, it's in, I don't. It's it's tied in with other budgets, but if you're if you're trying to build something, people are aware of this. The cost of labor, the cost of materials, is skyrocketing right now, and so that's that's the type of thing that's going to drive the budget. Uh, and it's it's you know it's always moving up, but uh, it, we're certainly seeing that peak right now. Yeah. So they actually projected over the next ten years a decline. If we use their median, um, it was a decline um, uh, from. Th- a 3,607 down to 3,478 students in the entire K through 12 body. Uh, there is some uh, weirdness once you start getting into pre-K, uh, yeah. but it but that trend also didn't seem to factor in long-term housing trend, uh, homeschooling trends, um, as a result of COVID and the explosion yeah. thereof from, from COVID. So we're going to get into that in a minute, and especially the COVID-related stuff in, in just a moment. Mm-hmm. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on the declining, the continuation of the declining in enrollment that this uh, enrollment study has had revealed. So first things first, real quick, the enrollment study looked at 10-year enrollment. It looked like building utilization, and it, it looked at actually redistricting. We're not actually going to talk about redistricting here tonight, um, but especially as we're going to talk, expand too about the building utilization piece. You're going to be serving on operations and facilities, and we've been talking about that a lot tonight, so we'll expand upon that. But briefly... Uh, what are your thoughts on that declining enrollment, that continued con- declining enrollment over the next ten years? I was I was a little bit skeptical because uh, I see uh, a lot of dynamic. There's a well, there's a lot happening right now. There's uh, people moving into the area. There is the homeschooling aspect. Uh, yeah, and they didn't seem to address. I, I don't think they addressed the recent spike in people moving into the area. And, it, you know, when I look at that, there's people moving out and I'm like, OK, now the people moving out, are they retirees or are there people with families? And then the people moving in, do they have families? And uh, and so they that was that's kind of a larger thing that I saw left out. Uh, I think on a net in 200 sounds like a lot of uh, students, but it's spread out through all these classrooms. And so we might be talking a couple students a classroom. Whereas right now in the elementary schools, there are some cases where the classrooms are up right at their maximum. I mean, in, in fairness, that's like almost, it's only barely two thirds of peak though. So we're not talking about a declining of 200 over 10 years by itself. We're also doing that within the context of a decline from roughly 5,000 down to below 3,500. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to have to watch that. Like I said, it's probably not heading to zero. And, and, uh, and so it's, is it asymptotically approaching some uh, normal uh, amount uh, based on the town and the new buildings that are being put in? Uh, I, we'll see. It's, uh, I'm, I'm brand new to this and, uh, uh, and I'll, be, uh, I'll be, I'm real, what, I'm, what I'd like to have seen there also is how did past predictions match up with the reality? So it's, uh, yeah, this is, it's very curious. So, okay, so that on that note then, um, since they didn't really, you don't think they really accounted for the recent growth in, in, in New York City flight, because that's, that's uh, to, to me, that's what it seems like is being described here. COVID came in, Manhattan's not really a pleasant place to live in with COVID, so people have been moving 
out into the country. Uh, and New Milford is one of those places that people have been flocking to, um, which actually explains the increase in home values and the inc- an explosion in home sales over the last year. But the, the, trend, the study revealed that the trends were headed downward otherwise when it comes to that sort of thing. So let, let's talk then. Uh, let's We're going to branch out into coverage just for in a minute here. Um, sure. But as far as that that was concerned, what were your thoughts then on those trends as it relates to the explosion in homeschooling that we've seen in the last year or two? And for context, in case people didn't know, uh, the number of people who, of students who have been exited from um, Connecticut's, when it comes to the state, the in total enrollment in Connecticut towards homeschooling increased 600 uh, percent prior to this year. So you can expect, if that's to continue, that we're going to see a long-term trend. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on the recent explosion in homeschooling as it relates to the, the reports enrollment enrollment uh, projections. Okay, sure. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be uh, sort of guess, uh, estimating a little bit for you. That's fine. It's just a general okay. thoughts. I don't, I don't need to, say, to hear you say, well, I think it's going to actually affect it into this percentage, but you know, general thoughts on that. Okay, because first, I, I got to tell you, I mean, I really appreciate that report that they did on the projections. It was, it was quite comprehensive. And, and this last, uh, th- this past year, what happened with uh, the schooling, the, uh, the, the COVID crisis was a uh, was definitely a game changing event. Uh, I don't see that as a long term. Uh, I think that Every year, we're going to be wanting to watch this and monitor it closely. We certainly don't want to be in a situation where we're all of a sudden, oh my God, we haven't been paying attention for five years. Now we uh, we have to do this or we have to do that. Uh, I think we want to keep track of this. I I'm I think that they may have more missed the effect of people moving out. I'm more concerned with them missing that than you know, and new people moving in than I am with the fact of, 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 of people going into the home school. Oh, as part of the generic, the general trends that have been happening in Connecticut for the last, say, 20 or so years, 15 yeah. to 20 years, where people have yeah, been leaving Connecticut for other states. Yeah, that's a bigger problem with the, with the Connecticut situation. Now we've suddenly seen a change in this, and I'm not sure they're picking up. I, I think that, that those estimates are going to be a little bit low. Not... This just, like you said, I'm just, uh, I'm just throwing that out there. The, I think that the experts gave us that presentation, but they may have missed this because it probably happened towards more towards the end of what they were, yeah. uh, of the data that they were taking. It might not have been captured yet, but I, I think that that trend of folks moving out of the city uh, to the countries, uh, as it were, uh, is is real. We've seen it, and 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 they've, and they've got kids, or they're going to be having kids, and. and uh, and I think we're going to need a school system that can sustain them. And I think right the good news is I think right now we've got the bandwidth within the school system in terms of classroom capacity to, uh, to accommodate that. And that was made evident from that, uh, that meeting. Although there was, there was this couple places we're cutting it a little bit close in terms of, uh, you know, how many students are in the classroom. Uh, but uh, I think for the most part, I would, I don't think it's going to be going down over the next couple of years quite as much. This year we might see some drop, but I would I think the following years we'll start seeing it uh, level off. It, it certainly, as it might have been driven by folks uh, switching from public schools to homeschooling or private schools. So we got a little bit of a late start tonight, folks. Uh, we had some technical difficulties at the beginning. So, Erica, would you be willing to hang on for an extra five or ten minutes? The technical difficulties was my problem. So yeah, of course, I'd be happy to hang on. Yeah, yeah. So we're just going to run over a little bit. So I'll try to wrap up some of these questions here to get to get towards to get to our Q&A session here. That's, like the more, that's the more fun part anyways. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, so before we get into redistricting, because I only have one or two questions there, the, the topic that we talked about is facilities. And you are serving on the facilities board uh, subcommittee. You're not, you are serving on the operations uh, subcommittee. One of the topics that was brought up was there's two things I want you to opine on here. Hopefully we can kind of like condense these two into one thing. Yes. Uh, one is the ever, the never, uh, the, the ever continuing discussion of the move of the board of education's main offices out of the Catherine Lewis building on East street. And the, the quote that I have from the minutes at least is that there is quote sufficient room to move the board of education to Sarah Noble. Uh, and the study seems to, that was from the study itself. Um, 
So there's that. And then they propose this really interesting uh, idea, which I don't know where I stand on all this, but I would love to hear them opine more thoroughly on this. Um, as far as re realigning the intermediate school to be where Scaticoke is, and instead having the middle school serve where Serenoble is. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on the moving of these facilities, the moving around of these sort of things. Sure, no problem. The, uh, yeah, the move to Serenoble for the Board of Education, that I think is the only thing I would add to that is that's going to take, uh, you know, we definitely have the room in Serenoble. That's going to take some time to implement that. Uh, all of the, the costs and the, the, you know, what, what was quoted by the contractors and everything notwithstanding, I think the one thing, and I mentioned this to, to, to uh, Wendy, who I think is fantastic, by the way, was that that E Street school makes me nervous, it, mainly from the standpoint of the, the uh, mechanicals in that building are super old from my understanding. And, uh, and no matter what, even if we were able to start the, uh, the building the facilities, for the Board of Education to move today, it's, it's not gonna happen until next year sometime. And they're gonna to have to spend the winter through a school with some questionable mechanicals uh, there. It, mainly, the, my understanding is there's some problems with the boiler system. Uh, I'm sure there's just dozens of others. It's an old, it's a beautiful building. I love, I love going there and visiting. I, I don't think it's a good long-term solution to use that as, as office space for anything. Uh, so I, I think that the, the only thing I would probably add to what already we're doing is I would think we're going to need a, uh, if you will, an abandoned ship plan. If like what happens if that boiler just completely craps out? We don't want to incur the costs of replacing a boiler for a building that that would that just to maintain it, it, it we get a, we get no return from that at all. So I, my, that's my concern. I think that we just got to have a uh, a plan and what that might be. I don't know, but the, I'm going to start thinking about it and uh, we'll, we'll, I'm sure there'll be some ideas. I, I want to wait till I get to that first meeting to see if someone else already has some ideas, but. Uh, so how about the move then from, uh, how about the, the, the switching of the intermediate school with the meet with the middle school? I thought that was interesting. I have no thoughts on it, to be honest. Yeah, that, that, it, that's kind of interesting too. When you, when you go to that, uh, where the intermediate school and the middle school are, the, the Sarah Noble used to be the high school. Yeah. And it's, it's sized for the high school. I remember when my kids were there, they were little guys. My kids weren't big kids, but the, the school has, everything is set up for high school kids, not yeah. uh, the extremely not wide hallways, the taller ceilings, the taller facilities. Yeah. The fixtures are taller. Yeah. Yeah. Not fourth and fifth graders. The, yeah. the, the, the seventh, the sixth, seventh and eighth, when they, when they, when they were, were at school, that that's, I thought that that was kind of small and didn't have the, the athletic fields and stuff. I mean, at this point, they're starting to do cross country. They want to do soccer. The kids want to start getting into band. There's all sorts of after school activities. Um, it, it makes sense just from that, that, that switch. That's true. Uh, okay. But, all right. And I'll tell you what though, I, we really want to check out what the costs associated with that are. Because I think that might be a tough sell to some, and with rightly so. Because honestly, it's not like the kids are sitting out in an open field that's filled with mud and snow right now. They're they're, they're all warm. They can study. Obviously, they're making it through. Yeah. Uh, I think that in the in the greater greater picture, if there's a opportunity to do that, I certainly wouldn't be against it. So let's move on. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll skip redistricting because we're running out of time. And that's really like a, a, a near non-issue I would, I would consider. So let's, let's move on to COVID in the classroom. And I, I think you kind of knew that you we're going to run into this topic tonight because I think there are a lot of votes that are going to be related to that. Um, yes. So as far as Ned Lamont's or, executive orders in the classroom, I'm just going to say right out, this is a question I should probably be asking you, but I'm just going to say right out for the sake of concision. Most folks, most of what you see in the classroom, and I think you agree with me on this, is not the Board of Education when it comes to uh, COVID in the classroom. Most of it is coming from Hartford, not from uh, the Lillis building. So with that said, I, I'm assuming you agree, we agree with that. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, I just I just want to make that brief so we can just get through that. But as far as those executive orders are concerned, as it relates to the classroom, what are what, what are some of those executive orders that stand out to you? The the one that stands out to me the most is the masking. Okay. And and, and well, everything, the masking is part of that. It, it's it's with the 
the the the, the uh, all of the everything that they're doing in the classrooms to prevent this uh, spread of, of germs, which is which we have no choice. We have to implement this. This is down by the state. This is our job to do. We have what the state says is what we do, and that's a lot of people need to know that. You know, there's I know there's some folks who are really against the masking. Um, the board of ed. It's not like we like that. It's we have to implement it. Um, so yeah, the masking that's that's the one that I, I I think is the worst because it impacts. I had mentioned before you, you don't know what makes a society work. And I had mentioned before how schools there's a lot of things that contribute to that environment. We don't know exactly which one works, what the interdependency is, but I can tell you to walk around with your face card. It, implement, it affects our interpersonal relationships. And little children, they, they, we learn what someone's thinking. Are they telling us the truth? How to even talk? We learn by looking at their faces. Um, there's a dehumanizing aspect to that. Uh, we, and I would give an example, people driving in cars. They have road rage. They do things in a car that if they were just walking along on the sidewalk, they wouldn't do. And, and, and that's because the, the car kind of dehumanizes eyes is that person you don't see their face you don't you don't talk to them um i don't think these masks are helping the education at all um like i said though it's something that we have to do so we do it so this is an example like we talked about of a competing interest where if they are effective at spreading at preventing the transmission that's a good thing but also it's a bad thing because you know you want to have the kids who are struggling with like early language development to be able to see people articulate with their mouths yeah yeah okay so um do you know when those uh, that so when those orders expire if the orders do ever expire uh, would you be on board with removing those requirements for young children in the classroom in a heartbeat i'd be on board with getting rid of the masks and if they don't have enough people honestly Good Lord, I would I would volunteer to go in there and take down all those plastic dividers. I don't know if people have seen the plastic dividers they put yeah. up on the uh, on the desks. Um, yeah, and and not because it's just masks. I mean, I, I I like to look at things objectively, and so if if you want to make a change to any system, to me, I want to see what is your objective reasoning for doing so, and. Uh, you know, right now, okay, you could argue our objective reasoning is we have to do what the state tells us to do. Yeah. There you go. We won't Hands do are tied. Yep. The minute they stop telling us to do that, then there's no objective reason for it. And I would, I would be all for doing that. But, you know, to be fair, uh, I, I think the risk calculation that you're performing here is probably on the money here. That uh, the, the risk to children for, of outcomes, which is what we care about. We don't care about transmission. We care about outcomes is so low that... I don't see the benefit gained by forcing them to wear masks, and especially in regards to the competing interests, which is, like you talked about, seeing the faces. So on that note, though, what would be going too far for Ned Lamont? What would be a type of executive order where you would think would be worth having the Board of Ed stand up to it and say, we're not doing this? Um, Our hands are tied by the law. I would say the masking already crossed that line. However, we're, we're bound by law to do so. Well, and, at the same time, uh, let me let me be let me let me take this to a hyperbolic extreme. So, okay. if if we were talking about straight up box cars, at that point, yeah. I would assume that if we're talking about box carring children, as the per- proverbially box carring children, there would be a line that would where where someone would say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! We we want to be on the right side of history. We're not enforcing that." Um, so, yeah, exactly. what would what would be an example? Where is the line? Is basically what I'm getting to. What is the line where you would say, as a board as a board member, we need to stand up to, against this? Wow, that's a powerful metaphor. Yeah. And it, uh, it, it's got a lot, quite an, uh, an allegorical context as well. Um, I'm, I, I, uh, I can't wrap my head even around what they've done so far with the masking and the plastic dividers uh, from, from a, uh, I don't want to get technical on a statistical standpoint and everything, or, or even from entropy theory and how particles travel through space. I'd put your whole uh, audience to sleep in a heartbeat. For the <laughs> but the, well, you and I can have that conversation ourselves sometime then. This whole thing makes about as much sense to me as pushing on a rope. I, I, I'm very concerned with even the mask mandates. And uh, this is, 
you know, that's what you're going to get from me. If, if, uh, if you really for the masks, I have some friends who are, uh, that's great. Uh, I'm not, I, I'll give you my reasons why I wrote the most, mostly there's no objective evidence that they do anything. Uh, that being said, Oh boy, we, <laughs> we're on Facebook we, and YouTube right now. So hopefully we don't lose the stream. Oh, good Lord. You started this, but, <laughs> Fair. <laughs> but, but uh, honestly, the, you know, we, we have to do what's good for the, uh, we, we, we have to not only do what's required by law, but we've got to set a, an example for the kids. And I, right now it seems like they are coping with it. Uh, I'm well, they're kids. I'm, they're they're, they're going to, yeah, they're going to, they're going to put up with kind of a lot because they're kids and they don't, you know, that kids tend to take really well to authority, if you will, young kids do. anyways. They do. And, and that's something I, I don't particularly like uh, the coercion that I feel like we're, and, and we're doing with the children. However, though, how much of that is me projecting my own feelings upon them? I, I'm, uh, I'm not a kid right now, um, as you can clearly see, I'm an older fellow. But the, the, I think that uh, I, I am really concerned about, uh, about long-term impact of this because we've done something that is a big change to the way children interact, the way they look upon life. We, by doing this, we are keeping them implying that we're afraid of something, that we are, they're in a state of fear. I, I, I know that when you fear, I, I, one of my hobbies is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And, and I know when you go out there to fight, if you're afraid, you, you, don't, la you, you don't last long because it, 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 it ties up your mind. Your mind doesn't work. Your reflexes aren't there. You're, you're not thinking, you're running. Uh, and and we, want, we want to raise people. The schools raise good citizens. This is part of it, it reflects on our community. Are these, are these healthy, both physically, mentally? Uh, are they smart? Uh, can they deal? Can they go into the open world and interact with people and, and be happy and have families? Uh, I, hate to, I hate to look too big picture here, but this is a big change that we're doing. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really concerned about that. I'm watching it closely. Uh, okay. Yeah. I evaded your question about train a uh, boxcar and kids. Yeah, but... That's fine. I don't, I don't need, need to feel the need to, you know, be uncivil about all that. If you, if you yeah. feel you've answered the question, you've answered the question. Yeah. I, 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 do, I, I feel that for me, that boxcar event happened. I'm trying to do my best in a way. It might be why I'm on part of the reason I'm on the school board too, is because I want to, I, I can complain all I want, but I'm, I decide to do something about it. I want to get involved in it. And already I've learned a lot about it. I've seen the other people on the school board and, and you see them as real people and they're all working hard too. Uh, they're afraid or they're not afraid. They're, 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 they're prone to action or they're prone to no action. Uh, it, it, there's all types. Uh, I'm a little bit different and, and from, I'm probably a lot more, uh, uh, my job at work, I'm an engineer, is I do a lot of analysis. I, I look at things. I try and identify what the root cause. I don't believe in changing something if it doesn't need to be changed. Uh, so I'm, I, when I see this, it, it's a change to something that I thought was working just fine. Yeah, it really, really concerns me. So uh, folks out there who are watching, we only got about two questions left for Eric. Um, so, and they're going to be, they're going to be fun ones. They're going to be ones that we, that are going to like roll the disc and uh, roll the dice on whether or not we stay on stream here. Um, but folks, if you've got questions for Eric, make sure to get them in the comment section right now. Uh, we are going to do, get into Q and A as soon as we get done with all, with these couple of questions. So, uh, since the stream will be ending fairly soon, not too crazy soon, but in a few minutes, at least once we get through our Q and A, uh, folks, if you got those questions, get them out now, get them out now, get them in the comment section. If you're watching at YouTube, put them in the YouTube comment section. If you're watching on Facebook, get them in the Facebook, uh, get them in the uh, Facebook comments. If you guys think I'm softballing any of this, this is your opportunity to get the hard questions. And if you guys think I'm being to, uh, uncharitable, that's perfectly fine for you to bring up those questions too in the comment section. So get them in. Eric, last, last couple of questions here are going to okay. be, uh, are going to be fun ones. Um, so first things first, vaccines are being rolled out for children aged five to 11. I'm not going to ask your, your thoughts on vaccines in general, because I don't know that the vaccine for COVID is equivalent to vaccine policy you might implement for something like measles, mumps, and rubella that kill kids, right? Th those are diseases that kill kids by the score. So uh, I, since you, you seem to have some, some serious objections to masks in the classroom right now, at least, 
I'd love to hear your thoughts on vaccines in the classroom, especially as it relates to young kids. Well, especially as it relates to young kids, the young kids, they, uh, they're, they're tough like that. They've got these super immune systems. We haven't seen any indication, any objective evidence that shows that the kids need a vaccine. Uh, and that objective evidence would be, well, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a sad thing, especially in the context of children. Let's, let's just talk in terms of people, uh, that there's, there's fatalities. There yeah. are things in life that happen. You, uh, everything from uh, getting hit by a car to, to getting struck by lightning, to get, having cancer, there's, the, these are things that are, are always going to happen. Uh, when I look at something uh, on this, uh, as far as this um, vaccine uh, that, you, that you refer to, the, the question I would look for is, it, it, is, you can get it, that's great. What are you looking to solve? Uh, how many, what's, what was the fatalities this year versus the fatalities over the past 10 years during the same time period? Uh, have they changed? Uh, is, is, the, is there a, a risk versus reward with this? Uh, that, that, yeah, we've got to look at that. What makes me nervous is that the, there's, this seems to have taken on this coercive aspect with the vaccines that, that bothers me. Uh, I, I think over the past maybe at least five years, it really started to accelerate for me. Uh, probably uh, about 2010, it started. I started really noticing it. The, 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 the our governments were giving us thing. We're doing things that started taking away from their integrity. So I, you you question more. You question more. Right now, there's a vaccine out there, and there's a lot of people questioning it. Why are they questioning it? it there, people aren't crazy. It's not ignorance. They, uh, they. I think what it is is they they're being pushed too hard for this. There's there's a flu vaccine that comes out every year. Mm-hmm. They give it to me at work. I go get the flu vaccine. It's not a big deal. But if if all of a sudden if there's if if they're saying you don't get this, we're going to fire you and you're going to get no uh, no 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 uh, unemployment. Uh, you're going to lose your job, your ability to make a living. I'm I'm, I'm starting to question it because it's not consistent with what I see happening out in the world. So all right. So on, then let's let's ask the tough question on this last question. We got, talked about this with masks. Uh-huh. Let's say the uh, the executive orders do expire. I think they're set to expire in, at the end of December. If they do expire and the topic comes up, would you be in support of or op- opposed to a Board of Ed man- mandate that children get vaccinated in order to enroll? I would oppose that. That's we would straight have forward. Our- yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. That's- and I'm assuming it's based on the same rationale? Well, that's my ra- that would be my rationale for my kids. It's, it's not, they're not my kids. So I wouldn't, likewise, I wouldn't say they, they can't come if they've been vaccinated. <laughs> that's up to your, that's up to the parents. Uh, I don't think we want a, a, a school board or the government at large making too many decisions for our kids. That's, that's up to what a parent does. Uh, the parent is a really important part of, of, of the child's growing up, obviously, but they, they, it's up to them. If they, if they want their kids to have a vaccine, they should be free to do that. If they don't want their children to have a vaccine, uh, for whatever reason, they should be free to do that too and uh, let it happen. Okay, so so I'll add this one last question. I'm sure it's pretty straightforward too. This is a question I asked Pete. Can you be pro-vax and anti-mandate? Oh yeah, absolutely. All right. I, I have the vaccine, and I, but I don't think people should be forced to get it. All right. So, hey, folks, thanks for tuning in. Uh, thanks to all the people who have watched. Uh, we got a couple of comments here we'll get to in just a minute. Um, so uh, before we get into that, Eric, uh, if so, have just a reminder, everyone, we're going to do Q&A in just one second here. So get those questions in now for Eric when it comes to the Board of Education. Yeah, ask, I'm, I'm here to, to forward those questions to Eric, even if they're questions that, that Mark Zuckerberg might not like, even if they're questions that Susan Wojcicki over at YouTube might not like either. If we lose a stream, we lose a stream. So be it. Um, so get those questions in now and we'll get them forward over to Eric momentarily. Eric, last, last question, of course, yeah, how can people reach and follow you? Uh, that's on, on Facebook at it's Eric, E-R-I-C uh, space Hansel, H-A-N-S-E-L-L for B-O-E as in Board of Education. Okay. So it looks like we don't really have any questions here. We do have a comment that I'm going to try to phrase as rephrase as a question. So uh, looks like your wife, <laughs> Karen, uh, says higher gas prices could impact the school budget bus transportation costs. So 
the, the prospect of higher gas prices affecting those transportation costs. Your thoughts? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that's just one of many random things that can happen. Uh, yeah, we're seeing the price of, and that's going to also affect heating the schools. That's going to, energy prices are going up. Uh, there's inflation that I think that those are some, I think those might be big. Well, there's inflation, there is a uh, cost of energy. There is the cost of raw materials for maintaining the schools. I think those are going to be the real drivers of, of, uh, of, of cost. Yeah. All right. So it doesn't look like we have any, any further questions or comments from uh, Facebook. Doesn't look like we have anything else from YouTube. So that was actually really quick and short and easy Q and a session. Um, so Eric, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for coming on. Um, for everyone who's watching at home, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we will be back next week for sure. We are, are looking to schedule a town councilman for uh, Sunday night. We've also got some board of finance. I've got a board of finance member who we've been talking to. So stay tuned for that. Um, and we will probably be back. Um, uh, Wendy found back Eric facilities and ops uh, Tuesday, not Thursday. So just passing that on. Um, yep. So it's not Thursday. It's Tuesdays. Um, so anyways, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Uh, Eric, thanks for coming on. No problem, and, uh, Mike. Thank you.